Hello and welcome to this Bits of Q series on template metaprogramming in C++. I am your host, Guirain Bouts. Let's get coding. Previously, we created a small metaprogramming library and we created this type list template to represent a list of types as well as several meta functions which operate on this type list. We can check whether this list is empty, which type is at the front of the list. We can modify the list using popfront. We can check the back, pushback, popback, check which types are at a certain index. And the last function we wrote in the previous episode was this contains type that checks whether a certain type, such as this float, is contained in the given type list. All in all, this is starting to become a pretty nice metaprogramming library. But it still has one big problem, which will make it a lot harder for us to use this library. The different meta functions in the library only work with our type list. We can create a type list and, for example, execute the front function to retrieve the int. But what if someone wants to, for example, use a tuple with meta functions? Maybe they got this tuple as an output from a different function and don't want to construct a type list just to use our library. If we would now try to use the fronty function to declare a variable which has the same type as the first element of this tuple of int float pool, we get a compilation error. Error implicit instantiation of undefined template front of std tuple int float pool. And that makes sense, because if we look at how we declare this template, we can do that by clicking on this node here, we see that we only define the partial specialization of front for our type list. We could make this function also work for tuples by simply adding another specialization, but that's not really a good solution, as we'd have to add a specialization for every type list like template that we want to support. Also, if a user has its own type list, there's no way we can ever support it. The solution is not to explicitly use our type list, but instead make our function work with any kind of template. We do this by using template template parameters. Whereas before we used type names and integers as parameters to our templates, we can also use templates themselves as parameters. The syntax is quite straightforward. We use the template keyword, and now, just like when declaring a template, we use these angled brackets to indicate that we want a template that accepts a variable number of type names. Then, again, just like when you're declaring your template, we add the class keyword and the name for our template parameter. We'll just use list here to indicate that we expect a template representing a list of types. Because we have our compiler set to clang 12, we already see an error popping up. Class template partial specialization contains a template parameter that cannot be deduced. This partial specialization will never be used. That's because we just added this list parameter, but are not using it in our specialization yet. So there's no way for the compiler to deduce the type of list. So let's fix that. Where before we used type list in our specialization, we will now use our parameter list instead. And everything compiles again. When the compiler tries to process this instantiation of fronty, where we pass it this container of types, it will deduce that our list template template parameter must be type list. And our t0 must be int, t1 to n, the variadic parameter, will be pool coin float. And that is why. Also now, if I scroll back to the bottom, our fronty works on this tuple. So in this case, the list template parameter will be deduced to be tuple. And similarly, we can create a new custom type container and use our function on that type. So with this small change, we made our meta function a lot more versatile. Let me make the same change for the other functions. So here, we have the empty function, where again, I'll specify a template template parameter turning this complete specialization into a partial specialization for any list-like template when there are no template parameters specified. I'll fast forward through the rest of the changes. Okay, that should be everything. I should now be able to use, for example, our contains type meta function on the tuple we defined before. Great. A small change, but now suddenly everything is a lot more generic. This is not the only use for template template parameters. We can also use them as actual inputs to our algorithms, not just as a container type. As an example, I'll write a function that takes a predicate as input. I'll again take some inspiration from the standard library, 
as we are going to write an any meta function. This any function will accept the predicate and the type list template and will check whether any of the types in the list match the predicate. So we'll use a template template parameter for our predicate. This time we want a template that takes only one type name. So we're going to pass the types from our type list to it one by one. And as a second parameter, we'll just use a type name for our list. Let's start with a simple base case where the list is empty. We'll again declare our predicate template and our list, but now we'll use a template template parameter for our list as well. This allows us to now define a partial specialization for when we are called with an empty list. In that case, we inherit from std false type, because if you don't have any types in your list, then clearly none of them match the given predicate. Now we write a definition for our main template, which we only declared before. So again, we have our predicate template and the type name for our list. This should be sufficient, as we have a nice metaprogram library now, which allows us to manipulate this list as needed. We'll inherit from the if meta function, which we created in one of our first episodes. If the predicate matches the first type, we can check this by calling the predicate on the front T of our list and requesting its value member. Then we simply inherit from std true type. Else, we need to check the next type, which we'll do using recursion. Any called with our predicate and now the pop front T of our list. And then we request the type member to get the resulting type. Now recall from episode two, we have a name here, type, that depends on a template parameter. So this is a dependent name, and we have to add the type name keyword to tell the compiler that we are dealing with a type here. Finally, we need to request the type of this whole if statement, and that should be it. We'll add a shorthand so we don't have to write the colon colon value every time we want to use this any function. Static const expert bool any v is equal to any of the predicate, the list, colon colon value. Now we verify that this all works by writing a small test. We'll use static assert on our any v, and now we'll just use a predicate from the standard library, std is integral. This predicate should define a value member that's equal to true, and it has passed an integral type such as int, long, unsigned, etc. Next we'll pass a type list of int double std string, and that should pass as int is integral. Indeed it does. Let's verify if this also works when I put the int at the back of the list. All good. Final test, what if there's no integral type? Say if I make this a float, then I'd expect the static assert to fail. And indeed it does. Great, I'll just add the negation to make it compile. Now that we have our any function, we can actually express our contains type as an invocation of any with a custom template. So let's give that a shot. I'll just move contains type down and we'll comment out the old implementation. So we just want to call any here with a predicate that tests whether the input is the same as our search input. So how do you write such a predicate? It would be nice if we could just use std as same with our search, but that doesn't work as std as same requires two parameters. And we cannot just pass it with only one parameter filled in. If we try to do so, we'll get an error. So let's write our own predicate instead. We'll define a template same as pred, accepting a single template parameter, which is going to be our search type. And then here comes the trick. We'll define another template taking another type name u, which we'll call predicate. And here we will inherit from std as same of t and then our u. This allows us to now invoke our any with same as predicate of search and then the nested template predicate. In this way, we essentially encode our search parameter in this nested type, allowing us to create a predicate which takes only a single parameter, but still checks it against this search type. Of course, this again is a dependent name. Our predicate depends on the same as pred template. So we again have to help our compiler out a bit by adding the template keyword, so it knows that predicate is actually a template. And now everything compiles which means that all of the static assert that we wrote before pass. In other words, we have successfully re-implemented our contains type using just a single invocation or new any meta function with a custom predicate.
This shows just how powerful these template template parameters can be. We have used them not only to make our meta program library work on arbitrary type list templates, but we also use them to essentially compose meta functions. Because indeed, our predicate is simply a different meta function. So we are now passing a meta function to a meta function. This is a powerful tool to write ever more complex and intricate meta functions. And with this, we have covered all the basics of template meta programming, which means that in the next episode, we'll start putting these things in practice. We'll be implementing our own tuple and associated algorithms, and in doing so, we'll see how we can combine meta programming with runtime data. As always, you can find a link to the code we wrote in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more. See you next time.